Hello and welcome to the next episode in our video series. Today we're joined by Master McLeod, who we're very grateful to have with us. So just by way of introduction, Master McLeod graduated from Oxford in 1993 with a degree in experimental psychology. She also completed her doctorate in human visual science, which has links to modern day studies on artificial intelligence, interestingly, also at Oxford, and she's a chartered psychologist. Whilst writing her thesis, as if this wasn't enough work, Master McLeod had already embarked on her law conversion course, which our current students will know as the GDL. On finishing the Law Conversion course, Master McLeod was called to the bar in 1995. She was a tenant at Quorum Chambers practising general, civil and costs law. Victoria then became a Deputy Cost Judge of the Supreme Court in 2006, and she was later appointed as a Queen's Bench, which is now the King's Bench, Master in 2010, making her the youngest Master and the second ever female Master in the High Court of England and Wales at the time of her appointment. Master McLeod sits on the Civil Justice Committee Working Group on Pre-Action Protocols. She is the Advisory Head of Interdisciplinary Collaborations at the EU Euro Expert Project at Sorbonne in Paris. She's a Senior Associate Research Fellow at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies in London and Associate Fellow at the Global Network on Extremism and Technology. She's also a regular national and international speaker and author on legal tech and also diversity and culture issues in the law. She's also an expert on the Royal College of Psychiatrists working group on non-recent child abuse and until recently served as one of the 12 nominated whistleblowing judges in the UK. So Master McLeod is also a legal author, having written the Surveillance and Intelligent Law Handbook for Oxford University Press, and she contributed to the Equal Treatment Bench Book in 2021, as well as compiling the several editions of the Civil Procedure Handbook and authoring and editing the White Book since the year 2000. In 2019, Master McLeod was chosen by the first 100 Years Project to be one of the 100 role model women, women in the legal field, spanning the first century since women were permitted to practice in, uh, sorry, the law in the UK. If anyone hasn't had a look at this, a fantastic project, so definitely have a, have a look. Um, and Master McLeod was also one of the Sunday Times 50 Women of the Year in 2020 and was selected for the Women of the Year Awards in 2021 in the UK as well. Master McLeod was selected by Sheffield University as one of a range of legal heroes to be honoured with a plaque at the law faculty there too. So we're so incredibly grateful to have Master McLeod with us today. Thank you so much for kindly agreeing to have this chat today as part of our video series for LGBTQ plus History Month, which is of course in February. So as you will already be aware, we're having a chat with people who are members of the LGBTQ plus community and are thriving in the legal profession, which we're hoping will be inspiring for the members of the LGBTQ plus online network society at the University of Law and anyone else who may be listening. We're especially hopeful that our videos will be inclusive of the many international members that we have who aren't able to take part in our online um, events due to their wishes to remain anonymous. So their anonymous participation is mostly due to the fact that the LGBTQ plus community are unfortunately not accepted in the countries that they live and that they're studying in. But we're hopeful that the series will not only be a way to include those people, but also will act as a beacon of hope that you can be your true authentic self and you can thrive in the legal profession. So as a key example of that, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, the first set of questions uh, has, a, has a legal focus. So firstly, Master McLeod, you previously practiced as a barrister at Coram Chambers. Can you tell us a bit about the area of law that you practiced and why you chose this area of law? Well, I mean, I should say, um, I'm, Coram is actually my third set of chambers. I started uh, in, in a temple, three Dr Johnson's buildings, and I, there I began my career because I did pupillage uh, mm -hmm. and I practiced really common law. In other words, general civil law, family and crime. So I've done a bit a bit of everything. Um, in fact, I was at the Old Bailey last night for the sort of leaving celebration for two senior judges. And I realised it was the first time I'd been back there since about 1998 when I played a small part in a, a multi-handed murder case. Uh, that made me feel very old <laughs> that it had been that 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 long. Um, after that, I spent a brief, brief spell in, in Grey's Inn doing much the same sort of stuff. Um, but I'd also by then picked up a bit of costs work and those among your, the, the university members who, who perhaps have an interest in costs will know that that's that is basically how much you pay for a court case and the whole process of dealing with that because the loser will usually pay the legal costs and therefore there's a process for assessing that and it involves quite a lot of law um, and then I ended up at Coram which is actually a well-known family set even though I didn't really do family by that stage um, I moved with a group of friends and um, settled in very nicely there with a little bit of a niche in, in civil work people suing each other, landlord and tenant, stopping people getting evicted, that sort of thing. 
Um, and then as you said, I moved on to judging 2006 onwards, really. Yeah, so as you mentioned, you're now a master of the, well, the King's, King's Bench. Bench. Yeah. <laughs> Can you yeah. tell us a bit more about what that involves? Um, well, it's it, it's a sort of subset of being a full high court judge in the sense that we we try cases and we manage cases um, and we have a bit of a balance between the two. So I don't try cases all the time. Um, I mean, I've got, I was meant to have a trial this week, which settled. I was supposed to have a trial next week, which just settled. Um, and then in a couple of weeks, I've got another trial. But in between, we also manage a lot more cases than we try. Mm. Uh, and that involves working out how much the parties are allowed to charge or at least if they charge how much they can get from their opponent it involves how long you have to take certain steps in the case what experts there are sometimes it involves throwing out a case if it's hopeless and all and indeed ultimately choosing the level or type of judge and even where in the country it goes if there's going to be a trial and encouraging settlement so that's a very interactive process and we also handle the case after judgment and as i say for some cases we also try them too so we get to, as I would say, we get to, to sort of clear up our own mess for those <laughs> in that we manage and try our own cases so so yeah. that um, you get to learn what works and what doesn't the hard way sometimes. Yeah. So a lot of our members will be on the GDL and they might not come into uh, interaction with costs. Um, I currently work in a law firm, so that's the only reason I know anything <laughs> yeah. about it. Yes, it's but, um, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm subscribed to the Civil Litigation Brief, which is an amazing yeah. newsletter for anyone who's interested in it. And they keep you updated a lot of it as focused on costs. So if anyone's interested, that's definitely a resource that you could uh, sign up for that would be really helpful. Um, OK, yeah, so this big video... area. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say a big area actually it, it now is cost budgeting because um, mm. it's it's brought forward. What used to be the case in a court case is you have costs at the end and it's about yeah. who pays what when the case is over. But now it's all brought forward so that there are at least estimates and budgets as to how much the case should cost as it goes on so it's now a very integral part of legal practice whether you're a barrister or a solicitor um, yeah. and uh, we do a lot of this budgeting process it's not all about costs it's a lot of it's about experts and other things too of course but cost has been brought forward and it's more important perhaps than it ever was so interesting it's, I, i'm on the same floor as um uh, clinical negligence and uh, personal injury i personally work in court protection um but yeah it's a fantastically interesting um i don't think you really think about case management or anything like that until you maybe do the bar course or maybe later on but um it's definitely something to look into and get head on if you are interested and you're listening to this and think wow i haven't heard of that yeah. before um okay yeah. so moving on to obviously this video series is about um lgbtq plus people and history month um so we're trying to talk to people about their experience in the legal sphere and we're particularly focusing on positive steps that can be taken so Master McLeod, you came out as a trans woman whilst you were at the bar. This must have taken a huge amount of courage. Can you tell us a bit about your experience of coming out at the bar? Um, well, I mean, my I came out obviously really to colleagues and clients. Uh, I mean, I, you know, this was definitely pre-social media in any meaningful sense in any case, although I don't think I'd have come out on social media if it did exist. Um, but um, uh, I, I came out. I mean, I'd been looking a little unusual for a while in that I was growing my hair out, having been on hormones for, I don't know, at least a year or something before. Uh, so I think people began to wonder. I, I, I came out the old fashioned way. I mean, it wasn't exactly pre-email, but I, I wrote letters to, to everyone and left them on the head of Chambers' desk to distribute the next day. And I didn't know how it would go down. Um, uh, trans people had only just, this was late 90s, uh, trans people had only just achieved any measure of uh, civil rights in the sense that some regulations have been passed which gave some very basic employment protections nothing to do with goods and services or anything of that sort but some very basic employment protections um, and I took the decision then that that was prop now that I was a newly practicing but self-employed barrister so I was secure couldn't be got rid of if you like uh, I wasn't in training I thought that was the good moment to to do that Obviously, I you know I'd known I was trans since I was five or, or whatever. I've said said this many you know, many times. That's just how I was born. But um, you know, there came a point in my life which was the was the sensible time, if you like, to to do it. Mm. Um, it wasn't possible in my day to have, um, for example, puberty postponing drugs, which would have helped because my voice would have dropped. 
Uh, your lights are you keeping too still. My lights, I was doing a little dance to get the lights back on. Sorry about that. I, I take that as approval. That's really nice. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, so, so, and, and that would have been really useful for me because I'd have, I'd have known I wanted them, um, and um, uh, you know it would it would help one's voice not to have broken. But but I transitioned very relatively young. I was in my twenties. Um, it was fine. People were lovely. Clients were lovely. I got people writing back saying, "Well done, congratulations." It was it was a good it was a good time relatively because I think attitudes were um, there'd been a you know difficult time leading up to the late nineties, um, but actually think uh, attitudes were becoming more um, very much more accepting, um, and indeed we we then saw that if you like the um, an early pinnacle in terms of the Gender Recognition Act two thousand and four, um, which then enabled me some years later to be in that first cohort of people who were fast tracked through to get my birth certificate changed and to change my legal sex because until then uh, my legal sex hadn't changed all my documents except for the birth certificate had but um i then was able to to officially change my legal sex which you know um probably didn't make at the time a huge difference in the sense of you know my life carried on and changed but it did enable me to you know know that i had the right documentation and, and so on um since then things perhaps of, of more recent times have become harder but certainly at the time everyone was lovely mm. yeah i think you um have previously spoken on uh, different podcasts mm. i think it might have been mm. with um i can't remember which chambers it was i think it was gatehouse chambers um, and you, I think it was, yes I think it might have been then or it might have been yeah. when you were speaking on the 100 years project but you spoke about a sense of relief that you felt after coming out which i think will resonate with a lot of people so would you be able to expand a little bit on how important it was for you to be able mm. to bring your true authentic self to work well i, I mean I, really at a massive practical level as anyone who's, who's done this will know um you know if, if you're particularly i was hi i was hiding it because because you don't want to come out before you come out if you sort of mean um yeah. So um, you know, you've kept this to yourself for a very long time and confided to very few people. And of course, your whole um, you're living a sort of two two lives. You don't want to sort of let things slip. Also, the whole process of transitioning actually takes a lot of time. I was spending half my life going for this or that electrolysis appointment or, or what. I don't know what people do now. I don't know if they still do electrolysis or they just use fancy lasers. But in my day, it was lots of thousands of needle pricks um and you know it took up a lot of your life so in addition to taking up time uh it took up massive mental space mm -hmm. um and it, you know it was a, it's a bit of a worry you don't know how things are going to go what you're going to do you know it, it takes up your time and and i found that when i um just did, did what i had planned to do and came out and transitioned um that, that was one very large thing less to think about um, mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I found that it sort of freed up a lot of, as I said before, a lot of mental capacity in terms of my uh, ability to function as a lawyer. And it was really only after then that my career sort of took off. I got more book contracts. I um, ultimately became more confident. Um, you know, there's a bit of a bedding in process, shall we say. I mean, that first occasion when you, you know, I don't know, a few weeks before you, you're, you're one person, the next you turn up completely different and turn up to court and there you are, you've got to speak in public and do a court case. It's not, yeah. you're not just turning up for the, for the, and you've got clients and there's a judge, you don't know how it's going to go on. And uh, you've got the journey to the court in the morning, you don't know if you're going to get any grief on the way. So the, that whole process, it took about a year before you get completely comfy. Um, and the more comfy you get in yourself, of course, the, the less hassle you get um so after that initial period you know you end up a lot more confident um and um uh so i got yes i got half myself back um and and you know my i've had a lovely time really i you know i wouldn't live my wouldn't live my life any differently really i know you know when i was a kid i used to and this would be really common for many trans people you know you lie yeah. in bed thinking oh please can i wake up and it will be done and nobody will know and i won't be in any trouble you know mm. um yeah, I kind of would have liked that. But equally, I've had a really, I, I really value the experience of, of being trans. I really value the experience I had of transitioning and the wonderful people I met on the way and how actually I've seen an awful lot of goodness in people. I know there's lots of nastiness at the moment, and I've seen some of that too, of course, but there's an awful lot of really nice people. And I, I, for the future, I'm optimistic. <laughs> for the short term, it's horrible, but most people are nice people and it's really difficult to believe that sometimes with some of the things we see but most people are not nasty people and and so for me it was a very positive life-affirming process 
um, I mean, rather like some people who have who are differently able, let's say someone is, um, let's say they're blind. Some some people say they really value that and that makes them who they are and they don't they don't regret that. I I personally have no problem with the sense that I went through that process and I think it just made me who I am and I'm, I'm happy with that. Fantastic. I think, as predicted, that did absolutely resonate. Um, and I'm sure it will resonate with a lot of people. I think it's really important, the first point you make about sort of like the literal time it takes up and afterwards being freed up to write books and you've contributed to hugely important texts like the Civil Procedure Handbook and the White Book and stuff like that. So you literally have more time, but also being able to present yourself sort of more authentically and honestly mm. um, freed up space, maybe mm. like emotionally you can um, bring your true self to work and that probably was um a, a huge relief i think and, it made and... people more com more comfortable with me too yeah uh, that if you project your true professional self and in this case yeah. you know, i was projecting with the barrister that's what they see anyway they see the barrister and and often after i transitioned and it was a re regular thing you'd get clients saying you really enjoy your job don't you they'd say to me outside court um yeah. and so the fact that I got to that point where everyone could see actually I was just enjoying myself and having a rewarding time that that really showed I think why transition was a very good thing for me. Mm, absolutely we've heard that from other people that mm. you when you're being honest or when you're it's not that you're being dishonest but you're holding something back people mm. can sort of tell so mm. to have mm. meaningful relationships with your colleagues or with your clients being mm. able to be your true self is so important um, and people can definitely tell um, and I think your last point um, speaking on um, how oh god i'm so sorry i completely forgot what i was just about to say but we'll move on to the next question anyway um but yes i think um you've spoken before as well about prejudice and you gave i think a fantastic definition of prejudice so you referred to it as a prejudgment so the application of rules or beliefs without proper or fair consideration so typically this takes the form of rigid decision making informed by presumptions or superstitions rather than balanced evidence um, so do you think that there are any practical ways that we can address and tackle prejudice or bias, even if it is unconscious bias for members of the bar or of the judiciary? I I mean, I, I often say I, I say this, it's, it's going to get boring. I, I often say more parties um, because <laughs> <laughs> because and it really is going to get boring because you keep saying it, because actually what I what I firmly believe is that you can tackle prejudice just by being part of one community with people. Um, people need to know you and just know you as a person um mm -hmm. I, i'm not education is is important but just telling people x y and z people can switch off i mean we have the equal treatment bench book that tells judges all sorts of things but you they have to remember to look it up they have to pay attention <laughs> they have to know it's there um and it's you know, presumably it's it's practical but dry actually if you get to know people whether they're trans or anything else um that's a great way of of, of doing away with whether it be unconscious or conscious bias, and particularly pre prejudice, prejudgment, um, based on things you just don't know and assumptions. Um, uh, so pe people bring all sorts of assumptions that they've picked up from watching, you know, Psycho, the, the Hitchcock movie, or or any number of uh, you, you know movies where the trans person is either the murderer or the murdered person. You know, or you, you pick up all these stereotypes. Uh, and heaven help you if you read many of the newspapers at the moment, what impression you're going to get. Um, it's only by knowing people uh, and interacting with people that that I think you're really going to knock out uh, a lot of prejudice. Probably works both sides because I think, you know, as a, as a trans person, it can get very tempting. I mean, I've been through this, you know, whether we all try and deal with it, but I've been through it much earlier on. Of someone says something as you walk past. Are they saying it about me? Uh, you, what did I hear? And you have to you have to sort of get yourself into the mode of thinking, probably not. <laughs> you know? uh, and and cause so we do bring our own prejudices sometimes uh, 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 towards non trans people. We can assume someone means offence when sometimes they don't. Sometimes they do. <laughs> um, but I adopted a process of saying if I'm walking down the street, unless I'm absolutely sure based on real evidence that someone is abusing me or whatever, I'm just going to write it off because someone may not be talking. To, I may have just overheard a snippet of someone else's conversation. And you can become a bit uh, self-conscious, not least because many trans people, myself included, particularly early on, you know, you get threats, you get you get terrifying situations um, and, and it can make you hyper vigilant. And it's important to be vigilant. 
Um, so we, we bring our own conceptions as well to the non-trans community. Um, and, and actually interactions between both groups would, would, would be a good thing. And of course there is a lot. I mean, you know, most people are fine, but more of it, more parties. So. Yes, completely agree. I think <laughs> and there's sort of a phrase being uh, thrown around at the moment, which is main character syndrome and the fact that everyone has main character syndrome because you're all the main yes, character for your story. This is all about <laughs> me. Yeah, of course. And you forget when you're in the line waiting for something in, in Tesco and something goes wrong. You think, mm. why has this happened to me? Well, you know, the person in front of you has got a life as well. And they're the main character of their mm. story. And you might overhear something. You may think they're talking about you, but they they might not be. Um, but I think the, the really poignant thing uh, to take away from what you've just said is that um, people do make mistakes or people do, um, you know, there are it's not always from a bad place the comments that people might make or the things mm. that people might say it might mm. either not be in relation to you at mm. all or sometimes if it is um you know it's worth putting someone up on it but and explain to them why what they said might not be particularly mm. helpful or might be prejudiced but uh, you know it doesn't it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the end of the world unless like you said it is repetitive or sometimes it can come from a bad place but it's important to know the distinction between the two OK, so um, also sticking with the same theme of sort of the LGBTQ plus experience in the legal profession, um, we think it's really important to highlight that being LGBTQ plus does not need to be the first and foremost part of our identity. It's one of the many things that make us who we are. And actually, that point that I forgot I sort of trailed off on earlier um, was leading on from you saying that um, you wouldn't change your experience for the world. And I think that's so lovely to hear. And I think we it, we touched on it in a different mm. video. I interviewed a trans man and I said to him, um, I think it's obviously being trans is really difficult and it comes with its barriers that you have to overcome and many difficulties. But if you hadn't have had that journey and that experience, you wouldn't be here today on this video series and you wouldn't be here today, Master McLeod, as the first trans judge. And I'm sure you probably get sick of hearing that. You think, well, I'm just a judge. But the fact that you're the first trans judge. <laughs> that's what I tried that... to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, you are not just a judge. God, that I got outed by the press know. in 2016. I tried to keep my head down because um, I don't I don't want it to be, you know, I don't want my judging to be read in that, to be read ho -ho, in that light. Yeah. Yeah, um, but but yeah. but but you know that that there it is. Um, yeah. But no, I'm 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 proud of, of, of being trans, and I, and the thing is, it it's a privilege to have had the experience. I mean, people who are not trans uh, often think that, uh, you know, I was assigned male at birth, therefore I knew what it was to be male, mm. and then I became female and knew what it was to be female. It's not quite like that in the sense that I was I was seeing the world through my own eyes with a female gender identity, with knowing I was really a little girl, but in a world where the rest of the world saw me differently and I was expected to act so as to be valid in a certain way. So you experience um, sexism, if you like, or the different, as, as it was in the 70s, especially, you know, the different treatment of girls and boys, you experience it vicariously mm -hmm. and you're aware of how unjust that is. Mm and how painful that is because you are seeing it and identifying with it so you're not privileged in the sense that you know you're happy being 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 male you, you're actually horrified by it and you're aware that you're not even allowed to identify with that and and then think and think of it as wrong you, you know you have to identify you have to sort of try to you're expected to internalize values you fundamentally disagree with and which actually counter your fundamental identity even as a small child so it's a great privilege, actually, to have ex to have had that particular perspective, mm. as well as having the rather wonderful experience of feeling how a change in your hormonal environment can alter your perception of yourself. Mm. So that I have experienced, if you like, biologically, two different hormonal environments. And it's quite an education in how powerful the biology of sex hormones actually is in terms of your own mental self and how you feel in relation to others. Um, and that's a great that's a great privilege, which only very few of us get to experience. You only really get to experience that if you are trans one way or another. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and I, which is why I think the trans community have a lot to add to feminism, have a lot to add to equal rights for, for both sexes, because we actually have experienced some of the biological factors that underpin uh, gender, sex, and how society treats you. My body has changed as a result of hormones immensely. I lost my muscles. I've changed physically. Um, my internal mental environment changed gradually and subtly and wonderfully, so as to be concordant with how I had already identified. And a lot of the debate around trans people is somehow about 
it should be about biology. Well, yes, it is <laughs> in part biology. It is how I was born um, and how my body has changed over the years as I went through what I might call trans puberty, the, the kind of the, the taking of the kinds of hormones your body would have otherwise naturally produced. Uh, had, I, had I gone through puberty at a younger age um, and that whole experience uh, emotionally of going through that and if you like having a second a second puberty um, so it is biological <laughs> uh, and, and and this is why it frustrates me when I when I when I hear people saying you know um, the, the biology is important well yeah it is I, I was born trans <laughs> you know, thanks yes indeed <laughs> thank you and that's why sex is important because I, I am legally of the female sex. I have sex discrimination rights. I have rights to safe spaces at work. And that is as important to me as it is to everyone. And as equally so to trans people who want to be safe using the loos, bluntly. And you, know, you hear a lot of trans people who are increasingly feeling unsafe using the loos for either their gender or, or in, in the case of those with a GRC uh, legal sex. Um, there's a lot in potentially a lot in common if both sides of the uh, of the rather unpleasant debate that's going on could actually uh, engage with each other. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think um, I would hate to keep repeating myself, but um, there was a, we mentioned gender toilets before, mm. and I said that I was once at a sort of prof it was a professional environment, mm. but it was somewhere that was where lawyers meet, uh, which is traditionally a male profession. So there weren't women's toilets in the particular building that I was in, and I had to go into a different <laughs> building. I know building, yeah, <laughs> not just floor. Yeah. So while I was walking to the other building, another woman joined me and we were walking and she said, isn't this crazy in today's day and age? There's not a toilet in the same building and we mm. have to go into it. We have to go outside, get our coats yeah. on, go outside and go. And I said, yes. And this is exactly the issue that trans people face. They might not have uh, a toilet on their floor or even in the same building. And that's still something that hasn't been addressed. And I don't think it's just for trans people to address that issue. I think if you're in a building at work and you know there's not gender neutral toilets on your floor or even in your building, it's for all of us to get involved and to sort of draw attention to that and say this isn't right. Someone should be able to carry about, carry on their working day and not have to leave the building or leave the floor to go to the toilet. That's absolutely crazy. But I think, yeah, the, the key takeaway from that is that it's a debate worth having. Everyone should educate themselves um, a, a bit more and advocate for trans people if they can. Because I mean, in my, in my case, you know, I mean, people have to choose, you know, I, I, I uh... You know, I, 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 my, my sex is female. I use the the female loos. Um, mm. Gender neutral loos are actually at least there are more of them about anyway. So in yeah. a sense, you you know, you're not going to get any hassle. But um, it's important that that you end that in the case of it, women or men, but in the case of a woman such as myself, you know, you want to feel safe in the in the ladies' loos. Yeah. Um, we all have that in common, uh, mm. <laughs> uh, and as uh, and and hence this kind of faux battle between. You know, women who happen to be thought to have been assigned male at birth and 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 people who say we well, you know we're a danger is it's just that um mm -hmm. people who are dangerous are dangerous you don't have to be trans to be dangerous okay. um yeah. and we we all want to feel comfortable and we all have a lot in common and, and so sex sex rights in that sense are are, mm -hmm. are are important to all of us I, we wouldn't we wouldn't i wouldn't have changed my legal sex if it wasn't important and it wouldn't have been important to have that process um, if it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it used to matter even more because if you wanted to get married, you had to marry someone of the opposite sex. Um, that has actually changed subsequently, but that was, that was another factor, of course, at the time. Uh, as it happens, I'm in a same-sex relationship anyway, but, um, you know, that there was a whole plethora of, of reasons why you needed to change your legal sex, including, actually, of course, not losing your job because some employers would want to see your birth certificate. And I come from the era where if you show, showed your birth certificate, you'd be sacked. <laughs> Simple as that. Um, and I come from the era where, you know, you'd be turned away in shops. You'd, you know, you had none of those protections uh, where, you know, recruitment agencies would claim they couldn't get jobs. <laughs> you know, um, you, the whole the whole sort of thing that people from other minorities will have experienced. Um, so the ability to, to correct your documents in that way is, is is important. It doesn't give you extra rights in the sense of in, allowing you to hassle people or break the law or anything, but it does uh, treat you equally with other people of the same sex. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so sorry, I've sort of pulled you into a rabbit hole there. <laughs> taking oh, you, I, I, you can start, you can throw me down the rabbit hole and I'll, I'll keep <laughs> digging. <laughs> well, there's so much to talk about, isn't there? But um, yeah, so we think it's right important, now. where I started yeah. with that is that I think it's important that it's a part of our identity, but it doesn't necessarily have to be no. the first and foremost part of our identity, mm. although it's something that we are very proud yeah. of. I mean, I'm um, half Welsh and that's really important to me. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm not trans Welsh, I'm just... Half Welsh. Just Welsh. I'm half <laughs> Irish. I'm very proud, <laughs> proudly Irish. I think I probably, yes. I think people I work with in particular, probably the first yeah. thing they think about me is not the fact that I'm um, bisexual or yes. um, pansexual. They probably just think that's Lucy. She's very chatty or she's, <laughs> she's always on the phone or whatever it is. They probably don't yeah. think first and foremost that um they don't think about my sexuality and I'm glad no. that we're sort of in a world where that is becoming the norm um but obviously we still should highlight that it's some it's a part of us and it's something we're very proud of and as you've touched mm. on um it makes us who we are and it also is a chance for us to become role models for other people who um, mm. might feel like that's been held back at, at the current time um so I think particularly in LGBTQ plus history month we really want to celebrate this part of us and champion our role models like you um and we also want to to offer lots of support and encouragement to LGBTQ plus people who are considering or who are already pursuing a career in the legal profession. So with this positivity in mind, what piece of advice or encouragement would you offer aspiring legal professionals who are LGBTQ plus people? Um, I would... Well, sort of get... <laughs> this is going to sound so old-fashioned. It would be like, well, get on with it and don't... I mean, social media is nice, but, you know, you, you, you really don't need to, you know, um, make if, I, I think if you go on. I mean, I, I'm pre pre social media era, thank heavens. Otherwise, I don't know what I'd have done. <laughs> but. You know. Being trans, being LGBT is not necessarily performative and people can misperceive um, identity as purely performative if we put it entirely out on social media because it be, it can be perceived as if, as if we are focused on our image more than our substance. Because in a sense, with social media, it is mostly image, literally. Um, and if, if one's going to be a legal professional, actually the focus should be on being good at that, um, being someone who helps others and mentors them, and not simply being identified as trans or whatever, on social media as your main characteristic. So if I if I if I was to say you know you're a trans lawyer, perhaps most of what you put on social media should perhaps be about law, um, if that's what you want to pursue, um, so that you are then you may be known to be trans, but you are making it clear that you are actually a lawyer being a lawyer. And we we see that we see you know the converse happening, helpfully sometimes. You know when you get an abusive person on social media, and they make the the mistake of publishing with their, their company name attached or their employer's name, you know, um, it, it gets back to them. And, and if people focus too much on being trans, then of course the public or others can lose sight of the fact that this person is also an X, Y, or a Z, a lawyer, a surgeon, you know, whatever. Um, so I think um, moderation, <laughs> I, 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 I sound so old. I'm only 53. I'm not no. 83. But, well, but moderation. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, I, I my relationship with social media is very um, I don't use social media very much. I may as well be from pre social media times. I use LinkedIn and that's pretty much it. Yes, I do. That's all I use. Yeah. I'm not allowed really to use anything else, to be honest, being a judge. Yeah, uh, well, I don't actually have that excuse. I just don't really like it. <laughs> I think it takes up a lot of time, which could be spent maybe better elsewhere. Um, but I think that um, people who do use social media, this has gone over my head quite a lot, unfortunately, because I don't use it. But um, Stonewall have recently um, sort of launched a campaign drawing attention to it. it's called cyber self harm. Mm -hmm. So it's people from the LGBTQ plus community who go on social media, as you've mentioned, and um, draw attention to the fact that and that's completely fine. You have to be yourself but they will um, get involved in debates with people mm. sort of strangers on the internet mm. about issues that deeply affect them so for yeah, that person they're exciting. engaging yeah. with they're a troll and they're sort of looking to upset people yeah. whereas for something so deeply personal to yourself mm. that's um, mm. something that's going to really upset mm. you and it mm. seems to be really prevalent and people are really suffering mm. from it so that's mm. something that maybe I'm glad mm. that you mentioned and I would like to draw attention to no, I mean, if I anyone think... yeah yeah, no, I, I, I totally understand that I mean I think I, you know I think I've, I've experienced this in the sense mm. that you know I, I had someone, I, you know, I won't identify them, but 
through a species of social media suggesting that trans women were a threat to women and children and that that was independent of shall we say anatomical considerations it was completely independent mm. of all that in other words inherently i'm a threat mm. um and actually I, you know I, I was horrified to come across that because i hadn't encountered that before within yeah. you know in a professional context um as a result what did i do um, I referred myself for a disclosure and barring check with the Criminal Records Bureau so I could produce a piece of paper saying I'm not. And I, I even referred myself uh, by way of a, a complaint against myself to the judicial complaints people so as to get a decision that I wasn't doing anything wrong using the lose at work because I wanted to protect myself in the event that someone made allegations about me. Um, I think that possibly falls into something that could hover on the basis of self-harm too because that whole process was upsetting it has some sort of rational reason for doing it but equally mm -hmm. i shouldn't have to put myself through that and it's a measure of how being confronted with something so unpleasant as a uh, an imputation against mm -hmm. your character because you're a member of a class can be deeply upsetting yeah. uh, and 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 i think social media has really um led to a sort of laser-like ability to focus this nastiness on people and to victimize um and um yeah i mean i, I agree it, it can be it can be a dangerous thing yeah i completely agree but i think if anyone has heard that and thinks even some of it resonates with you i definitely would encourage looking at um stonewall's guidance on cyber self-harm or even if it hasn't affected you or you think it hasn't affected you have a look at it because it's really interesting um and it might affect people around you they even on instagram they just have really quick infographics so even if you don't have a huge amount of time to read the full um report that's something that's quite interesting to look at so definitely encourage people to um read up a bit more so moving on to the next section we want to talk about lgbt LGBTQ plus opportunities. We really want to involve, uh, our, get our members to take up on opportunities to get involved, to give back, or to accept help from other people. And we think, if nothing else, it just builds up a bit of a network which is really supportive and inclusive. So, Master McLeod, as previously mentioned, you were until recently on the whistleblowing committee, um, having been chosen by the Lord Chief Justice as a nominated judicial office holder. So, um, for those who don't know about it, I didn't know myself, but the scheme aims to hold the legal system accountable and make improvements where there are shortcomings. Um, also, amongst others, you were, all, you were significantly involved in facilitating escaped Afghan women judges in the UK to find employment and training, which is fantastic. You've also taken part in the uh, judging the LSE Featherstone moot, and you've taken part in this video series today. So I think in saying all of that, it's very safe to say, um, despite being extremely busy in your working life already, you've been willing to take on further responsibility and dedicate further time to helping others. So can you talk a little bit about why you do this, why you're so passionate about helping others? Um, it's well, it's I enjoy it. I like the thing is I'm quite sociable. Um, mm. it's, it's a function actually of, of being com comfortable and confident in myself that I just enjoy other people. Uh, it, it goes back to what I said about you enjoy your job, don't you? The sense that that actually I do quite enjoy my job and I'm quite outgoing and I just get a lot back. It's selfish in the sense that I get a lot back from it. I, I enjoy meeting new people. I enjoy people having, visiting my court, seeing what we do. Um, I took a, uh, I only work four days a week now. I took uh, a day, I, I took a pay cut to have a, a day off. So I have a day a week when I can devote myself to all sorts of other things. So for example, you know, you read, for example, I'm doing a thing with the Sorbonne, which is to do with in, incorporating cultural expertise into the law, which in, can include uh, cultural in the sense of LGBT as well. And I, I just completed a chapter that's going to be in a book that they, they produce. Um, where, where I'm looking at it really for trying to expand the concept of culture from simply, uh, if you like, race in asylum cases or whatever, to, to, to other aspects of culture, because there's quite a gulf of understanding between trans community and other parts of the community. Um, so I, I get to do all sorts of fun things like that, but it also means I get to affect things. It isn't just about being a kind of do-gooder. It, 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 I do actually get to change things. Mm. Uh, I get to be seen and hopefully to actually change the world that affects me as well. So it's partly about self-actualization as, as, uh, as well as pleasure. Mm. I'm not just being charitable. <laughs> well, there's a saying, I think, about mm -hmm. um, every all altruism is self-interested or well, something yes. like that. But, Social but psychology. I think... uh, yeah, I did psychology. You know, yeah, it's kind of in there somewhere. Why are we altruistic? There was a whole back in or uh, well, there's a whole literature on that. I don't know what the state of it is now, but yeah, there was always yeah. discussion about why are humans altruistic? Yeah. <laughs> 
No, I think you do so much that we can't really apply that here, but we'll let you get away with that answer. Um, so <laughs> having just mentioned the um, LSE Featherstone moot, I just sort yeah. of touched on it, which you are judging this year. Yeah, coming um, out on Saturday this week. Fantastic. We so we yeah. we've mentioned it in the series already a couple of times because we spoke to Robin White um, yeah. and we also spoke to two people who took part in the Featherstone moot. And both of them had absolutely glowing reviews. So we'd love to encourage our members to get involved. Can you talk about any of your involvement in it or anything you have to say? Well, I mean, I, I was just honoured to be invited. I've been doing it for I think this is probably my third time. Um, it's, it's, it's good fun. They have a nice party afterwards and in fact I think they have a party the night before um so <laughs> um so uh but it's 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 a lot it brings a lot of people from all over I think it's all over the world I mean I've, I've mm. met, you know there's certainly the International Bar Association had a team a couple of years ago um it's a very positive uh, event it's 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 just nice to see um I'm honored to to be invited each of the last three years or I think there's a gap for for, for Covid um, it's quite fun because also you do not know what university or college the teams in front of you are from. So it's genuinely blind as to um, any presumptions you might bring to bear. And it's really interesting to see, because I, I I'm doing the final again, mm -hmm. who actually wins and, and then find out who the team, two teams were. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's sort of genuinely based on that complete lack of, of knowledge, which I think is really cool. Um, and yeah, it's a it's a lovely way of bringing people together from all parts of the LGBTQ spectrum, and very positive thing. More more of it would you know, go power to their elbow. More parties. I completely parties. agree with this. <laughs> okay, so um, moving on to the next section, which yeah. is questions that people are afraid to ask. So we invited yeah. questions from people outside or inside the community. The question we were going to ask, I think we've touched on quite a lot. Yeah. Would it be OK if we asked you a question? This is sort of in relation to LGBTQ plus history month. So someone asked, why do LGBTQ plus people need to have a whole day in brackets pride? Whole day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's actually a whole month, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We get a whole day in brackets pride and a special flag to celebrate their community. So would you be able to talk about what pride means to you and what the flag means to you, perhaps, which might help enlighten this person as to why it's? Yeah, I, so I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, pride, pr pride can be understood as as kind of a kind of self aggrandizement or something. But but I think really I, 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 I see it as partly commemoration in the sense that it's proud of our cultural history, which goes back a lot a long way and is international. Uh, I, I mean, if you look at it from the trans perspective, uh, you, you know, um, non-conventional approaches to gender and sex are something which crosses uh, international boundaries. There are plenty of cultures with models other than the male and the female or which recognise movement between the male and the female and venerate it and respect it. I, and I, I think actually having the concept of pride in your community in that way enables you to take a holistic approach and, 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 and to, to value uh, what you have and to take time out to say, yes, we've come this this far, yes, we have our own values, our own history. It's also a way of remembering uh, people who've gone before us. I mean, the, the whole trans rights situation, you know, we, we got as far as the initial sort of vague employment rights in 1999 and the Gender Recognition Act 2004. That was built on by people who were, um, if you like, the generation before me with whom I overlapped, who had fought very hard in the absence of rights and in the face of enormous prejudice, patiently liaising not 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 having social media fights with because it didn't exist anywhere, but they wouldn't have wanted to yeah. patiently being diplomatic, persuading and getting there. And we need to be very proud of the work that that generation put in that. And the same would apply with gay and lesbian rights, you know, prior to that, when um, homosexuality was demedicalized in whenever it was the 70s, I think, and decriminalized in the 60s, you know, the trans community is you know, has lagged behind, but is catching up on on that. We need also to remember the people who've, who've died along the way um, for, for whatever reason. You know, one of my oldest friends died of an accidental drug overdose many years ago. And that was indirectly because of the particular drug culture in the particular gay male community that he was socialising in. You know, it, 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 you can you we've got lots of people we've lost over the years and, and particularly you know I remember people in the 90s there were trans people being uh you know I, I remember one person was thrown off a, a cliff 
uh, you know, and, and drowned. You know, there, there is a history here and we need to, to sort of take it on as well to remember. I know we have trans, sort of trans remembrance, day of remembrance as well, mm. but I think linked up in it is a pride in remembering and also, if you like, summoning the, the spirits of people who've gone before. Um, you know, ha having the ancestors, <laughs> if, if you like, from an anthropological point of view with us. Mm. I think that actually leads on in a lovely way, talking about the people that have gone before us into the next question. Um, so uh, for LGBTQ plus History Month, um, we were wondering if you have an iconic or a favourite iconic member of the LGBTQ plus community that's inspired you. Um, and I predicted who you were going to say, and I said that they're now my icons. Yes, they're yours you now. So, they, should yeah. I do my one first? You can do your one first okay. then. The only thing I might need help with is pronouncing her, the, the I, I know her name's Sarah, Jane Reese. Jane Reese, but her bardic name is Cranogwen. Cranogwen. Yes, a cran know. Cranog is um, the Welsh people will, dif will differ about this, but a Cranog, I believe, is a an island in the middle of a lake, a small oh, okay. one that might be useful to to build your hut on or whatever, which is surrounded by water and is therefore quite safe. And when mm. tends to mean white. Okay. Uh, oh, white Cranog. Okay. People will differ about about that, um, but but that's one. It, it's it's quite poetic, as you know, Welsh bards that have a bardic name but anyway over to you well i didn't actually know that before but having listened to and done a lot of research on master mcleod for those who are listening um she's mentioned chronog when before and i thought that this was well this is now my iconic um lgbtq plus um person so she's actually um uh, an ancestor of master mcleod um and uh, as we've just mentioned she had a bardic name because she um was a bard so she, she was actually, the first first female she was bard the first bardic, female yeah. bard yeah. so she was um she actually won the bardic crown as well for her poetry um and yeah as you've just mentioned she was the first woman to have been honored in that way um so she um is not so well known in england i believe but she is very well known in wales so if there's any welsh people listening to this they'll be very pleased that we've included them um <laughs> in the series um so uh yes she was a fantastic woman most interestingly she uh, ended up teaching she was a master mariner so she also then ended up teaching people in the village. She had a navigation school of her own um, and she was referred to fondly as or the school was ref or the people at the school were fond uh, referred to fondly as Cranagwen's captains. Um, so she travelled to America. She was a popular speaker at temperance movements um, and she uh, is just a fantastic icon for women generally, I think. But also she there's sort of a question mark over whether she was LGBTQ plus, um, which is so interesting because she sort of lived uh, prior to the Victorian times or in the Victorian times. She was, yeah, but she was a Victorian and um, she never married and had stable female relationships. Well, how oh. that would have been seen. Who, you know, it's in a sense, mind our own business in a, in a way. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, so I think you mentioned that yeah. she had two long term women partners. Yeah. Yeah. so um yeah i think it's just generally fantastic and i haven't had chance yet to read her poetry i'm not sure if her poetry will be in welsh or would it be translated into it's, english it, I, it, it's it, it's in um it's in welsh you can probably get translations i'm i'm, I'm not sure it would be uh, although she did win the bardic chair uh, I, I mean yeah. it's it's victorian poetry it's quite romantic poetry yeah. i think the winning poem was called the wedding ring and I, you can know. read a subtext into the sort of subjugation of women in marriage if you like i i, I don't know um but um no I I, I, I'm, she, yeah. she she um i'm told that i never knew my grandmother but b because of the age gaps in my family you know that my grandmother was a long time ago and apparently my grandmother as a little girl knew chronogrin as an old lady and apparently she had a, a wicked sense of humor i'm told <laughs> this has been passed down through my mum who was told yeah. this by her gran by her mother yeah uh, and she was quite fearsome she yes yeah, she sailed her own ships yeah. She sailed to America. She preached the temperance movement. She'd been pretty awesome. You can get pictures of her, actually, from the Welsh Library. I like yeah. to think that I looked like her. You can make your own mind up. I, I've seen I, the photos, I think actually, there's a and I agree. Resemblance, and I was really I proud agree. when I discovered it. Yeah. Um, and you also but, mentioned a children's book where she's on the boat and she has her plowing. hair yes. flowing in the wind, yeah. which I thought I was think a beautiful she even has a black cat, I think. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I've got, it's, out of, it's out of shot, but my cat... <laughs> My grey cat is just out of shot, Libra. Um, well, I'm, um, and I'm just going to get him. Hang on. Yeah, get the cat. Get the cat. Come on, Libra. <laughs> Here we go. That's Here we one, go. Well, that's one. There you are. That's 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 this particular. Uh, we just need a cat. wind machine, and now you are Pranogwin yeah. on on the ship. 
<laughs> so, um, and, and yeah, there she is on the, the prow of this ship. And there's a children's yeah. book. It's big, big. It's got big drawings and it's big colour. And it's in Welsh, but with very large, simple Welsh and big print. So it'd be easy to pick up on if you were English and didn't know Welsh. You could look it, look it up and so on. And it's really about her exploits. Yeah. Uh, and it's such an empowering image. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a, it, 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 you know, it goes to it goes to, to feminism as much as it does to mm -hmm. LGBTQ. Certainly, she was non stereotypical, whether mm -hmm. in terms of gender roles, sex roles, uh, uh, or, you know, it, it, she probably fits. You know, I'll probably get uh, if I were on social media, I get abuse. But you, know, she, you might call her queer in the sense that she is, yeah, you know, the Q. <laughs> She, yeah. she 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 challenged uh, all these gender roles at the time very successfully, yeah. uh, and uh, so I'm very yeah I'm very proud to have, you know, a historic connection. She didn't have children, so I'm not a direct descendant. You have to kind of go up and across a bit, um, but the personal connection and the social connections there through you know through my my grandmother. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. I think that was so everything you said about her has just been so touching so anyone who's listening to this I will mention in the bio what her uh, name what her full name is so people can look it up but fantastic woman um okay so uh, I just wondered because I've stolen your icon I have to you, choose one yeah, yeah if you have an icon <laughs> <laughs> well you see I, I uh as you, as you said at the start I actually trained as a scientist originally before I became a lawyer so my my doctorate was in experimental psychology which and actually how the brain processes three-dimensional images so it was uh, it's computational, really, although it was a part of psychology at the time, it was actually computational. Um, and, you know, it's part of that. You studied AI at the time. This is back in the 80s. And, and of course, as part of that, you come across Alan Turing. Um, so Alan Turing is the person I'm naming, partly because I I, I, I like his, his science as well. Uh, and he, he, you know, he suffered. He's one of the people we must remember during Pride uh, because he was a fully actualized, successful, brilliant scientist who also paid the price for not being, in his day, acceptable. Mm. And um, we need to bear in mind that, well, we need to celebrate people like him and we also need to bear in mind the example uh, so that we stay on, on our guard against becoming ourselves the unacceptable people. Mm. Uh, and um, we, we need to sort of ha have people like that among us, you know, as our, as our ancestors when we, when we celebrate pride. His paper on um, where he first set out the notion of the Turing machine with the punch tape and so on, I think it's 1950s, well worth reading. It's in such a uh, accessible language um, that, that it's it's actually worth reading. You know, I read it as an undergraduate. It's worth finding and reading because he wrote very well, actually, as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I mentioned to you earlier that um, the intro and the outro is from The Imitation Game. I have never studied at all. I've done the GDL I did it over two years part time um, and I did not study once without listening to The Imitation Game score because it is fantastic. If you haven't listened to it, you have to um, and you have to watch The Imitation Game, the film, um, which explains what uh, sort of happened in Alan Turing's life and, you know, the unfortunate um, ending to his life but all the brilliant stuff that he did up until that point so definitely well worth watching for LGBT. I'm, I'm going to bring in another uh, since we're talking music uh, yeah. when I was studying for yeah. my version of the GDL uh, I used to listen to Under Pressure Freddie Ooh. Mercury and David oh. Nally I think that so would there make you go. my heart <laughs> palpitate if I listen so to that. Freddie Mercury another another LGBT icon. Fantastic icon. Um, and you know David Bowie definitely challenging gender norms Mm -hmm. uh, great piece of music if you want to be motivating yourself uh, for exams. Yes. Um, there's a, there's always Jump by Van Halen as well, but that's a different story. Um, no, but but, but under pressure, I always used to like. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll add that to the list of people. <laughs> yes. and so you could have that as the intro, as an outro for one. <laughs> yeah, shall I do it? I'll try and work out if I can Dang. add that. <laughs> Might get in copyright trouble. I'm not sure, but <laughs> um, anyway, over to you. I just wanted to um, ask you if there was anything that you wanted to add or anything you wanted to emphasise from our conversation today, or a closing note that you wanted to leave our listeners or viewers with. Um, I, I just say, I mean, at the present time, I mean, you know, we, we're recording this February the twenty to 2023 just for the benefit of future historians I mean at the present time particularly trans people are getting a lot of hassle mm -hmm. uh, a lot of stereotypes a lot of nastiness particularly social media if you're on it could stay off it um, a lot of a lot of stuff's going on um, I just want to encourage people to try and be as peaceful as possible be calm and support each other and always value your, your allies. And I also want to thanks, of course, to, to allies who are always terribly important. And if, if, 
if someone sees a trans person in any difficulty, uh, obviously to try and stand by them. Fantastic. Thank you. That's an amazing message to leave us on. So I will say thank you and goodbye. Thanks so much for joining the series much. and hopefully we'll stay in touch. Thank you.